for a site visit, but we didn't because of the school. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. 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 I know the types of it, but it's not as good as it. 
If you haven't already, you can go ahead and open your laptop up to Excel and load up the spreadsheet that I sent to you yesterday.
Okay. That's so good. Some you're of you did not submit. Okay. So I submitted it late last night. Is that still fine? Pardon? If I have submitted it past six last night? It was fine. Okay. So you all got a little bit of a pass. This time. So everybody else? <coughs> all right, that's fine. We're in good shape. Yes. Yes. Okay, we're pretty much all back. Ready to go? Yes? Okay. Well, don't worry about the technology at the moment. Right now, we're going to go old school and go with a whiteboard. Apparently, I can't get my uh, surface to work with the projection here for some reason. Okay, so. Let's start, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a couple different things to kind of give you what I'm going to call a financial primer, okay? And this is, I mean, those of you that have, you know, had a, a finance course or two or, or, or so, you probably have seen some of this, you may not have. But what I'm going to try to do is work through what I feel are probably the most key, critical sorts of things for you to understand to get yourself started, okay? So this is scratching the surface you know, sort of, of information, kind of, we're going to walk through cap rates, we're going to walk through a basic uh, pro forma, and then we're going to walk through uh, basically front door, back door analysis. Okay, so those are going to be the three things that we're going to try to get through today and, and uh, go through and explain each as best as we can. Okay, so probably the most fundamental formula that you will be introduced to in commercial real estate is what I refer to as ERV, okay? Have any of you ever seen this before? Okay, a couple of you. All right, this formula in its most basic form is what they were talking about this morning with regard to cap rates. The I stands for income and specifically annual net operating income, okay, or property. The R can stand for cap rate. It can also stand for rate of return. <coughs> and the V would basically stand for the value of the property. Okay? Or sales price. Now, this little formula, believe it or not, is behind virtually every single valuation you're ever going to do on a piece of commercial real estate, okay? Now, we can make it a lot more complex with regard to the, the, the level of detail that we get into and the, the, the assumptions that we make with each of these variables and that sort of thing, but fundamentally, this relationship, if you understand this, everything else will become much easier to understand from this point forward, okay? This is starting at ground zero. so. Assume that we have a property, okay, that is, and we're going to go into actually calculating an in operating income, but let's just say that we just start out with a simple example that we have a property that is generating $10,000 a year in annual net operating income, okay? Now, as I said, we're going to explain net operating income a little bit later in terms of how we get to it, but this is, in essence, this is the real cash flow that this property is throwing off on an annual basis, okay? After expenses and that sort of thing, but yet before debt and all of that other sort of stuff, okay? And then we have maybe a, a cap rate or rate of return that we want to apply of let's say 10%. So based upon this very simple formula to come up with the value of the property using those two key variables, we pretty much put our hand over what it is we're solving for. Take income divided by the cap rate, that's going to give us value, and in this case, that's going to be a hundred thousand dollars. Does everybody understand that? So in other words, ten thousand divided by ten percent gives us a hundred thousand dollar value for the property. That's a super simple sort of analysis. Now we can approach this from several different perspectives. We could say, well, what if this property is actually for sale in the market for $200,000, all right? And we've got to effectively try to fit the other two variables to that price that it is currently priced at. Well, we've got a couple of different options. One is if we hold the cap rate constant, what does that mean we have to do? That means that we've got to increase somehow 
the net operating income to $20,000 a year in order to satisfy this equation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in other words, think from the standpoint, you know, we go out and we buy this property and we have to pay $200,000 for it. We demand a 10% rate of return and it was throwing off $10,000. We've got to somehow reposition that property in order to get it to generate $20,000 a year. Otherwise, we're not going to get our 10% rate of return. We've made a bad investment. Okay, makes sense. Now, assuming we can't get that income up to $20,000, that we're stuck with it because of market rates in terms of rental rates and expenses, we're stuck at the $10,000 level. But yet, we're still potentially going to have to pay $200,000 for it. What does that mean? That would mean if we then wanted to solve for our cap rate, $10,000 divided by $200,000, would mean that our cap rate is only going to be 5%. 5% rate of return, okay? Now, the question is, can we accept that? You know, is that a high enough rate of return that we're going to get what we're effectively expecting in terms of our investment-backed expectations for this property? Maybe, maybe not, depending on how much our cost of debt is, how much money our equity investors want, you know, those sorts of things. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes, fundamentally? Yes. Okay, now, to come up with kind of the, the, the assumptions with this sort of model, let's just sort of start out with the net operating income piece, okay? The way we do this, we use a very basic sort of, of pro forma. And this is one you should commit to memory, which is we start off with PGI, which is potential gross income, okay? We'll explain it here in a second. We take from that, we subtract out vacancies and collection losses. We add in other income, which gives us effective gross income. We subtract out total operating expenses, and that gives us the number we're looking for, which is NOI, net operating income. Now, once again, just to sort of make sure that you're, you're, you're listening, potential gross income. Now, let me define that for you. This is, and some people will also refer to it as potential rental income. And there are some minor variations there not to get ourselves overly enamored with. But potential gross income is the maximum dollar revenue this property could generate given the rental rates and the number of units or number of square feet within the property. So as an example, let's say that we have a property that is 10, well, we'll use a different number. We'll say 5,000 square feet, okay, in size. And in essence, the rental rate is going to be, let's say, $10 per square foot per year, okay? So in this case, our potential gross income would be $50,000. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? Okay. Now, one thing I should sort of point out here with regard to how we go about quoting rental rates on a either per square foot per year or on a monthly basis. Those of you that have rented apartments, you pay a monthly rental rate. Yes? And whenever you usually look at market information like you saw this morning with Reese, with multifamily residential, they report usually the data as a per square foot per month. Okay? So you need to make sure you're paying attention to that whenever you see that information because making that sort of, of transition back and forth between monthly data and annual data will be one of the first things that will trip you up. Okay? Because you'll say, oh, well, I've been doing it you know, on a monthly basis with residential, but then I'm switching over to office and everything all of a sudden is quoted in square foot per year. It can get a little messy if you're not really paying attention to that. But up front, just remember, for the most part, almost all residential data is going to be recorded on a, on a monthly per square foot basis in terms of rental rates. And for non-residential, it's typically going to be on a per square foot per year. Okay? So in this case, we pop that up. All right. Now, vacancies and collection losses. Um, you asked, I think, this morning about credit losses. Okay. Same thing. A collection loss is whenever you have a tenant that is there, but they're not paying rent. Okay. It's for the deadbeat tenant. 
A vacancy, on the other hand, is the space is actually empty. There's no tenant in the space, okay? So there is a distinction there, okay? Because obviously, if you have a tenant that's there, that's a deadbeat tenant, technically the space is occupied for the purposes of occupancy rates. So that can sometimes be a little bit of a fluke that you might want to just sort of be aware of in terms of the difference. So here, we're just gonna pop in, let's say, a 20% um, vacancy and collection loss, okay? So $10,000, all right? Other income, this is gonna be things like with an apartment, what sort of other income do you think you might be able to generate? Laundry. Laundry. Okay, you're also vending machines, <clears throat> parking, parking, absolutely, parking, whether it's underground parking, whether it's covered parking, you know, all that, that sort of stuff. So, you know, ancillary revenues that you're able to generate. With a commercial structure, you know, there's going to be a, you know, a whole set of other possibilities as well. I mean, you could sell, you know, the um, signage space on the top of the building or on the side of the building. You could sell, sell effectively the rights to put a, um, a cell tower on top of the building. You know, there's a whole number of other things of other income that is non-real estate specific income. Now this is, and I want to put too fine of a point on it right now, but you can have some properties that will have a huge amount of other income that can really distort, to a certain extent, the value estimate on that property. And depending on who you have looking at that property, they may not fully give you the value for all of that other income that is being generated off of that property. So but just kind of be aware, we'll delve into that in much more detail at a later time. Right now, we'll just go ahead and pop in $5,000 in other income. So 50,000 minus 10 would be 40, 40 plus five. So we did the math right, 45,000 for effective gross income. Is that right? Okay. Now, total, let me sort of mention, okay, effective gross income is much like what you heard earlier today when they talked about effective rent, okay? It is the real amount of income that is truly coming in off of the property after you have made adjustments for collection losses and other income the property may be generating. So that $45,000 is the real hard cash currency, if you will, coming in the door is one way to look at it. All right, now, total operating expenses. Now this is something that you're, once again, gonna be able to pull from Reese and, and other data sources. What is the standard normal kind of, of set of operating expenses for a particular property type. Well, with, with multifamily residential, you might find it's like between 30 to 40% of maybe income, okay? But other property types, it might be substantially less because more of those expenses are being passed through to the tenants, okay? Meaning that I, as a tenant of an office building, might end up actually having to pay my own, you know, set of bills. I'm going to have to pay property taxes on the, on the, on the building, the insurance, you know, in addition to the utilities and, and all maintenance and, and all these other sorts of things. Um, that with a multifamily residential, I'm not going, as a tenant, going to be paying, obviously, property taxes and insurance and that sort of thing on the, the property itself. Brandon, you, oh, no, you answered. You answer. Okay. So, so the, the, the point of this is you're going to look in the market and you're going to get a sense of what is maybe that range of values. Now, you would think that probably your higher end properties with more services to offer are probably going to have a higher percentage of total operating expense, especially with multifamily, that they're going to have a higher percentage of operating expenses relative to potentially more of a, a slumlord kind of property, okay, that doesn't have a whole lot of services. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So whatever that percentage is, you know, you sort of pop it in, and we're just, we're just going to say for uh, roughly, let's say twenty thousand dollars. All right. So that's going to leave us with twenty-five thousand net operating income. All right. So we've done all the math, and we're good with these assumptions. This would be the number that we're going to use in our model. Okay. So we go back up here. Let's say for a make an example. We pop in the 25,000 as our annual net operating income. Well, if we had a cap rate in the market of 10%, 
And that means that property's value is 250000 Okay? Is everybody cool with that? Now, cap rates currently, for the most part, are nowhere near 10%. I like to use 10% because it's a nice, easy math. Okay? In a lot of properties, you're going to see the, the currently those cap rates be 5, 6, 7%, depending on the property type. Okay, and depending on the risk. But let's just, so let's just say it is 5%. That difference then translates or would translate into the value of that property escalating dramatically to $500,000. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, what drives the cap rate? That should be one of the, the, the questions that goes through your mind is where does this number come from? You know, do we just simply pull it out of the air and sort of say, wow, let's go with 5%, let's go with 10%. All right. Where do you think it comes from? The value of the market. <clears throat> well, it comes from the market, but more specifically, it is going to be driven by a couple of different things. Number one, what are the prevailing interest rates? Okay. And the lower interest rates are, the lower cap rates tend to be. Okay. Because part of, of what you're going to be doing whenever you're investing in real estate, you're going to be looking for a rate of return that is hopefully a little bit greater than what you can borrow money at. Okay? But different property types within different markets are, I think I've got an eraser. Um, yeah. Different property types within different markets are going to have different cap rates. So, for example, what do you think is the, the least risky type of property as a general rule? Uh, self storage. That's a good one, but that's um, usually, I mean, in terms of broadly speaking, multifamily residential tends to be the least risky globally. Now, I mean, self storage is way up there in the sense that in some of the markets, without question, it is probably the safest, <coughs> most secure sort of investment out there. But speaking in terms of the major property types, we're, talk, we're, we're saying multifamily residential is probably going to be the least risky. Now, of the major property types, probably the on the higher end is going to be what? Retail and office, okay? Um, and then industrial, sometimes, you know, it kind of fluctuates a little bit, usually kind of in between sort of the multifamily residential and the, the retail and office. Now, does that hold up true forever? No. It just simply means that, as a general rule, historically, those property types have kind of behaved in that way. Now, what drives that, though, to a certain extent, is perception of risk, okay? And what I mean by perception is, based upon all the market information that we have available to us today, with regard to this particular property type that we're looking at, how comfortable are we that we are going to be able to lease this property up, keep it leased, keep stable rental income being generated year after year, or are we going to you know, be in a situation of where we're constantly going to be having to go back out into the market, release, constantly changing rent levels, you know, and have other sort of risks that are going to materialize, that are going to cause it to be more variable in terms of, of the, the return that it's going to throw off. So my point is, if you have a super stable, class A, top of the shelf sort of property, your cap rate's going to be low. If you have a high risk, you know, kind of in a tertiary market, no one's really paying attention to, class C property, that cap rate could be 15, 20%. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? All right. Now, in terms of, of usually getting at what the market cap rate is for a particular property type, you are going to go to the market and you're going to say, what have properties been selling at historically over the past year or so that are similar to this property? What have been their annual net operating incomes? And then do the math of number of income divided by the value, and then come up with effectively some sort of an average for that particular property type, and then that would be, in essence, the cap rate for that market for that property type. Does that make sense? Yep. Can you also say there's an inverse relationship between the cap rate and the value? 
A what relationship? Inverse relationship. Yes. Cap oh, value. absolutely. Yeah. That as <coughs> the cap rate goes down, the value goes up. Now, this relationship, and there's, and there's an excellent point to sort of make with this. Right now, everyone would agree we are in an extremely low interest rate environment. Okay? Everybody agrees with that, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you don't agree with that, then you're just not paying attention to anything that's going on in the world. So you've got to hopefully fundamentally agree with that. Now, if that is the case, and we are at probably one of the lowest points in terms of interest rates that we have, have pretty much almost ever been in terms of, of borrowing rates and, and, and that sort of thing that are available to us, what is going to happen to real estate values as those lending rates go up? Okay. In other words, whenever you're right now, if you're able to go out there in the market and borrow money for a multifamily project or any other project and you're able to pay three and a half, four percent or something like that as an interest rate and all of a sudden that escalates to maybe four and a half, five, six, seven, eight percent interest, what is going to happen? Down. That value is going to go down. That is the big, scary, ominous thing that is out there that concerns most of us in the, the, the real estate industry is this concern that as interest rates go down or interest rates ultimately go back up, that we're going to have that price pressure going down. Does that make sense? Okay. But yep. Wouldn't that only matter if you're trying to liquidate? If, it, if you're not trying to liquidate? Yeah, if you're, if you're not trying to, but, but see, there, there are other issues at that place there as well. That, okay, you're saying, okay, well, what if I'm planning on holding on to this property forever? Okay, and I forever, never, forever. ever plan to sell it. Not forever, but... Well, okay, but it, for, for, for the seeable future. future right. Okay, the, the other problem that you have that's going to potentially come into play yeah. is rental rates are probably going to adjust over time to reflect that, okay? And as those rental rates adjust, that could potentially, you know, be a problem for you, right. all right? So, you know, it's one of those sorts of things that, you know, it may not be an immediate impact because, like, multifamily residential is much more sensitive in the sense that the leases are short term. You know, most leases on multifamily residential are a year, okay? But with commercial properties, specifically office buildings, retail facilities, industrial properties, you know, at the minimum, most places are doing a five year lease. You know, in the more extremes, you know, maybe doing 20 and 30 year leases, especially if it's an absolute triple net deal, okay? So, you, but it's also a question of whether or not those lease rates are actually tied to the market or they are simply escalation clauses that allow the rents to just continually increase based upon, you know, some sort of an index that they set up. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways in which that number could change in terms of the actual dollar amount and, and the lease payments that are being made over whatever that lease term is. That within that five year lease term, you know, it may just simply be you're going to be paying the same amount today as a tenant that you are paying five years from now. But you could also have a lease that says this is automatically going to escalate each year by 2%, 3%, whatever it might be. You could also say this lease is going to change or the rate is going to change based upon some sort of an index like consumer price index or you know federal funds rate or whatever it might be that your lease rate theoretically could go down over that holding period. So there's a lot of different possibilities there that could you know impact this but fundamentally fundamentally if interest rates go up it's a bad thing for real estate okay it's not a good thing so this formula is for commercial property well com investment property anything that generates revenue i mean single family residential that's owner occupied doesn't make any sense but if it's multifamily residential you know property it will make sense because in uh, in like fourplex triplex multifamily yeah. this is the way around, they do, like when you're selling a multifamily, you have <coughs> the income divided by the value of the property to give you the cap rate. Right. And that's when they ask you, what's the cap rate of this multifamily? And you say 10%. Yeah, exactly. But it doesn't change like with interest rates or anything. 
No, I mean, it's strictly based on what is the income the property is throwing off, what is, and then ultimately this value though is going to be dictated indirectly by what interest rates are doing. Okay, because interest rates and cap rates tend to move together. In other words, before we had this you know, decline in interest rates that we currently have, cap rates were much higher than this. Okay? You know, easily I can remember, you know, in the 90s and the, the 80s, you know, we, we would have cap rates of 10, 15, you know, percent or, or higher for class A properties. Because what you're saying is the lower interest cap rate, the more value the property has. Yes. But well, in, in the sense of looking at the inverse relationship that exists here, because it's, it's a way of how you look at it. That, in other words, what you're, you're sort of saying is with a higher interest rate environment, you're willing to accept either a, um, you're, you're going to have to, you're not going to be willing to pay as much for the property, is all you're saying. Because that's what I learned so far. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe what I, I don't know. Usually, uh, somebody that wants, a client says, uh, what's the cap rate? I want to pay, buy a property that is 7% cap rate or higher. Right. So it means that the higher, the better the property is. You're saying the opposite. The, nope. low, the higher, the lower the property. An investor wants to buy a property, ideally, at a higher cap rate and, and because that means they're going to be paying less for the property. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, well, it's a the formula. But that's, I mean, because they, they, they said no matter what the property is, but I didn't look the other this way. Right. I used to, so okay, this property ah, cost okay. this, is listed for this, and the annual income, rate income right. they're making right now is such and such. So you're going to be getting 7%, 10% income right. cap rate. But it didn't look the other value. I mean, if you, that's different to if you're going to look into a value appraisal per person. That works in a different. The, the simple answer is there is an inverse relationship between the cap rate and value. So as, as cap rates go down, the values are going to go up. As cap rates go up, <coughs> values go down. I, I think also what you're saying is you might buy it today at 7%. But if interest rates go up and values go down, it might be only a 4% cap rate in seven years. That's what it's saying. Yeah, and it could be. That uh, absolutely that could be the case. In other words, what the going in cap rate you know, might be may not be the same as what it is four or five years later because at that point, your income may have changed. Which is going to happen. Right. As it's well as plan. potentially the underlying value of the asset. Yep. Okay, so say you were to get the value of the property, uh, you use the NOI, but what if you like subtract the debt service, you got the before tax cash flow, added taxes, got the after tax cash flow? If you put that into the formula, would it give you a more accurate yes. price of the property? Yes. Well, for you as an investor. See, yeah. here's, here's the, the situation, and, and, and you're sort of saying, well, why don't we just do that automatically? Why don't we just simply publish? you know, what the, the after tax cash flow is on the property. Well, the reason is because it's investor specific. In other words, if I buy a property as an individual, I'm going to have a different tax liability than if I buy it as part of a partnership, or I buy it as part of a corporation, or I buy it as part of, of some other sort of entity, as a, maybe a real estate investment trust. And so my tax liability is going to be different depending on the ownership structure that I use. So therefore, it's not apples to apples sort of comparison. Mm -hmm. But for me, with my personal investment backed you know, expectations, yes, I would go ahead and flow on down to after tax cash flow, look at what my personal rate of return is. And you know, based on that, that could very well you know, mean I am able to pay more or I'm able to pay less than other folks in the marketplace simply because of my ability to maybe get debt at a cheaper cost or have a different tax liability. Because here's, let me give you a very valuable lesson with multifamily specifically. It is almost impossible for you and I to compete in the multifamily market with institutional investors, okay? The reason for that 
is because institutional investors have access to very cheap cost of borrowing, okay? If they can borrow, in some cases, you know, down in, let's say, 2% levels, and the best that you can get is maybe 35 or 4%, they can pay more for that same exact property and ultimately get, you know, a rate of return that is equal to what you would have gotten, except that um, even though they're paying more for the property, mm -hmm. simply because their cost of debt is so much less. And so, you know, you're sort of saying, well, then what is the play for the average, you know, common person? And most, of, I would argue that you know this is the sort of these are the sort of deals that Reese doesn't cover. I think you were the one that actually even asked the question. You know, what about the deals that are less than forty units? You know, what about those deals that maybe only have you know five units or four units or, or, or whatever it might be? Units are not covered by you know a service like Reese. Those are the opportunities for the average sort of person to be able to kind of, of look for, but not necessarily in a major market. The real opportunity is probably going to be in tertiary markets. Tertiary markets meaning kind of the smaller communities that are less sophisticated, that you don't have as many people watching every little deal that pops up in the market. You know, one of the markets that you know I did extremely well in in Texas was the Bryan College Station, Texas market. You know, for those of you not familiar with where that is, north of Houston, what sort of populates that area? Texas A&M University, okay? There is nothing around Bryan College Station for pretty much 100 miles other than Texas A&M University. Mm -hmm. But yet you've got almost 50,000 students that live there in addition to a lot of faculty and a lot of other sort of support staff. Whenever I bought in there in the, in the late 90s, I mean, it was just absurd because there was no competition. There was no one, no one paying attention to what was going on in that market, and prices were ridiculously low, okay? You know, I was buying buildings for $10 a square foot. They were already constructed. All I had to do was take and reposition them into something that was usable, you know? So, you know, that's the kind of market that, you know, I think where the real opportunities are. But now, even that market has grown up over the past, you know, almost, you know, 15, 20 years, to where it's a lot more sophisticated than it once was. Does that make sense? Excuse me. Yep. So, I think maybe the confusion is because when we talk in real estate, multifamilies one to two four, two four units. So maybe you're talking about four to fifty or something like that because that's not the case between one and four. Because that's the, 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 I'm sorry. Let me, okay. when you, what you're saying is if that's that's what it is, then we have a problem in real estate. I mean, because prices are subjective of what people, yeah, I mean. Okay, okay. Here, here's, here's, I think what you're, where you're sort of coming from is, there is a lot of, as uh, one of our previous um, Federal Reserve Chairmen used to sort of say, irrational <coughs> exuberance, okay? <laughs> as it relates to certain, especially property types, that are available to the common person, those one to four sort of units, sort of sizes. You have so many competitors out there. Anybody and everybody with a little bit of a savings account is saying, oh, I want to get into the property market. I want to buy some real estate. And it's probably the, the worst decision they could probably make because <coughs> most of those properties are way overpriced because everyone understands to a certain extent that you know they, they've already been sort of picked over. So that's that's sort of my point. It does prove my point that there you have you know this situation of where properties are way overvalued relative to yes. their fundamental value yes. as it relates to because in, income. The famous location, location, location. Yeah, but, but the, the, does it make sense? It doesn't. But at the same time, what that's really doing, if you if you want to put it back in our model here just for a, a quick second. <clears throat> What you have happening in a rational sort of, of, of way is you may have this property throwing off income of $10,000 a year, and effectively what has happened 
is the cap rate on some of those properties, especially these local properties, have been pushed down to ridiculous levels of maybe one or two percent, or you know, so two percent cap rate on something like that. Well, what does that equate to in terms of a value? Right. I mean, it's absurd. It's make sure I don't screw it up. Um, so five hundred grand. Okay. But yet there are people out there that are paying that and are taking on the debt to do that and are, chances are, upside down on the deal with regard to they can't pay off the debt associated with the property. Does that make sense? Okay. Just because it might be selling in the market for 500000 with effectively a 2% cap rate on those, those smaller properties does not mean that it's a good deal. It just simply means you've got a lot of people out there that are searching for investment property for a variety of reasons. Maybe they've got an inheritance, maybe they've just got a big wad of cash they're just trying to stash somewhere, but the, the, the reality of it is the relationship itself still holds true. It's just a question of, you know, are there situations of where people are acting overly optimistically as it relates to the pricing of some of these assets, okay? Make sense? Okay, moving forward. All right, now, one of the things that we need to be able to do in terms of basic sort of financial feasibility on a deal is to be able to kind of uh, start potentially with information like this and work toward you know, how much is that property worth? How much could I, um, you know, spend on construction cost? You know, what are sort of my deal terms? You know, all of those sorts of things are, are, are gonna be, you know, the, the, the types of, of pieces of information that you're gonna need to be able to, to use. So what I've done is I've put together a little handout for you, which I think everybody's got a copy of. And I, one side of it is blank, the other side of it has numbers. Let's look at the number side here for just a second. The one that says SF FFA front door has got the numbers in it. And I'm, right now, all I'm going to do is just try to explain the logic, okay? And then we'll go through and do some numbers here in, in a little bit. But right now, just let's talk about the logic. So let's look down. We'll start with the back door because it's it's the one that's going to make the most sense to you initially. So down at the bottom of the page, under back door procedure. Okay. First of all, let me just note. Each of the cells that is highlighted in gray, those are input cells, meaning that you, those are the pieces of information you need to collect from the market to be able to populate the spreadsheet, okay? The cells that are not highlighted are effectively computation cells that there is some sort of math taking place there that gives you that number, okay? Everybody cool with that? All right, so let's just start with this, this first example. All right, so in this property, we've got 10,000 square feet of space, and we have researched the market, in other words, using REIS, using whatever available information that we have out there at our disposal, and we have determined that the rental rate is $15 per square foot per year for this particular property type. Does that make sense to everybody, yes or no? Okay, so those are both given pieces of information. So based on that, we do our first calculation, which is simply to come up with our potential gross income, much like we had done over there. So in this case, this gives us $150,000 of potential gross income. Okay, everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. All right, now, the occupancy rate, in this case, 90%, okay? Now, this is, is something that we can express a couple of different ways. We could say it's a 10% vacancy, or we could say it's 90% occupied. You, you know, kind of, you know, figure out which way works best for you, but for the purposes of our calculation, we're going with occupancy rate because of the math. So we're simply gonna multiply our potential gross income times that occupancy rate and that's going to give us effective gross income of $135,000. Now, in this case, for this particular um, uh, approach, we are effectively ignoring other income. Because if you remember what I said earlier, that's kind of non-real estate income, 
All right, we may want to value that separately. Yep. Curious, are you not using <coughs> replacement reserves for this example? We are not. And you know that is that's a whole other discussion for us to have as to you know what we're going to do in terms of setting aside money for replacing air conditioning units, you know, doing roof repairs, whatever else. For for this purposes, we're just sort of assuming a stabilized property with stabilized income and expenses. Another way to look at it is that that uh, is focusing on the operating pro forma, and what you mentioned, of course, about reserves really deals with capital. In other words, for the preservation or refurbishment of the property, which is really a very different kind of exercise. So it's all about operations yep. and how you can derive value from them. Okay. okay. So once we've got that effective gross income, then uh, what we're doing is we're subtracting out effectively the operating, in this case, our total operating expenses, or more specifically, as I've turned them here, estimated operating expenses not passed through to tenants. So what that means is these are the operating expenses that we as the property owner or investor are going to be responsible for paying. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so that number I've just simply listed as $50,000 that we would subtract out. All right, and then that gives us our magical number of net operating income for this property of 85,000. Okay, so it's pretty much the same sort of thing that we did over there, just in a slightly different format. Yep. When you say that has to be tenant, I mean like an example, like to be like garbage, they have to pay for garbage or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, really? like for example, if it's multifamily residential, we, as the property owner, are going to pay for like property taxes we are going to pay for the overall property insurance, the overall property maintenance and repairs that take place on the property. So therefore, those expenses are not being given to the tenant to actually pay for it. The only thing, the only real expense that you have as a tenant in a multifamily property are, you know, is going to be your rent and your utilities, okay? And maybe parking or, or something like that. But for the most part, the, the owner of the property is bearing that burden of all of those other sort of property-wide expenses. Okay. <coughs> but that's not the case typically with office and retail properties and industrial properties where you as the property owner may pass through virtually all of those expenses to the tenant. Okay. All right. So once we are there, to um, effectively our, our net operating income. Now, this is where information that you probably have not seen before, if some of this you maybe have, is to talk about something called a debt coverage ratio, also called a debt service coverage ratio. It depends on kind of who you're talking to. This ratio, very specifically, is equal to the net operating income that um, effectively is uh, generated by the property divided by the annual debt service that the owner of the property has to pay in terms of their mortgage payment, okay, on an annual basis. In other words, taking, calculating your monthly mortgage payment, multiplying it by 12, gives you your annual debt service. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? Okay, now, you may not quite know what all of this is, we're gonna kind of work through it. Okay, first of all, the assumption that I made in this model was that your debt coverage ratio is 1.2. Now, what that means, if you sort of just look at this for a second, we say that our net operating income is 85,000. All right, if you're the lender, your number one concern is you want to get paid back, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to make sure that this property is generating more than enough income in order to get paid back, yes? Mm -hmm. So you have set, as the lender, this debt coverage ratio of 1.2. What that means is you are mandating, in order for me to do a loan on this property, you must have a net operating income that is 20% greater 
than what you're actually going to be paying me in debt service. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so in other words, what the lender is saying, yeah, supposedly you're generating $85,000 a year in, in this free and clear income, but yet if you're gonna have a, a loan on this property, we are requiring that the payments be effectively no more, or in other words, they've got the, the payments to be 20% less, if you will, than an operating income, okay? Now, if you do the math, to see what number it gives us. So you would simply take 85,000 divided by 1.2 is going to give you 70,833 as your maximum annual debt service for that property. So in other words, that is going to be the annual dollar amount, the maximum annual dollar amount that your lender will allow you to effectively be making payments on. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to work backwards from this number to determine the actual loan amount, okay? Does that make sense? If it doesn't yet, it will, okay? So, this is where the financial calculator begins to, to sort of be involved, okay? So, if you're using the, the HP-10B, it's very simple. You're going to, have to make sure that it's set for 12 payments per year. You're going to pop in effectively 70,833.33. You're going to divide by 12 to get a monthly debt service. Okay? And that is going to be our payment amount. Okay? So let's just start with that. So that means our monthly payment is going to be 5902.78 rounded, okay, as our monthly payment. Does that make sense? Yes or no? For the mortgage. For the mortgage. Principal and principal and interest. And interest. Okay. Now, as we sort of work from that, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in some of the characteristics of the actual loan. Specifically, the interest rate, very high interest rate here, of 7.5%, and a 15-year loan term on a monthly basis, so that's gonna be 180 actual payments. Your calculator will automatically make that adjustment for you to 180 payments. And then you would, in essence, solve for the maximum loan amount. Okay, so let's just see what we get. So 5902.78 is our payment. 7.5% is our interest rate. 15 year term. And solve for the loan amount. And we get 636,753. 11. Now, let's see if that matches up at all with what we've got here. Well, they, okay, of this one, it doesn't actually even tell you what the actual dollar amount of the, the loan is. It actually just simply has you work through um, giving you some of the, the, the key variables and then ultimately you kind of have to figure out another, another way. But to suffice it to say, this would be the actual loan amount on the property. That's what you pay during the year, but that's not the value? No, this, this is simply the loan amount, okay? This would be the payment amount each month. This would be the annual payment amount. This would be the loan amount. No, what you pay for the property. No, no. what you potentially pay for the property, um, given that we have an 80% loan-to-value ratio, what we would do is take this number, divide by 0.80, And we get 795,941.38, okay? And it's off ever so slightly because of rounding. If you look down a couple of lines, maximum supportable total project cost. Does everybody see that? Yes. 795,941, and like I said, it's off by about 30 cents because of rounding. 
Okay, now, so this, what well, that number is telling us, that is the most that we can pay for this property, both land and building, in order to be able to satisfy our criteria up here of the um, $15 per square foot. So in other words, this is a great way for us to sort of say, if this is what the market rents are, this is what the, op the, uh, the operating expenses are, this is what our lender is effectively requiring of us in terms of a debt coverage ratio, these are the loan terms in terms of the interest rate and the term, what does that translate into in terms of the maximum dollar amount we could afford to spend on the property. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, once we have that number, and you'll see the next calculation is a simple one, which is to say, what are the expected construction costs? Okay, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how you got the 636000 If okay. you have um, 5,902 uh, 5, uh, payment, 7.5% yep. uh, interest in yep. 15 years, yep. Wouldn't that be more than a million dollars? Make sure that you've got it set on monthly compound. Yeah, but I'm, I'm doing the basic math first. Like, so let's say 180 payments and... No, the, 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 what you're doing is you're including months. principal and interest. I mean, this is including principal and interest, but this is the... I mean, this number is including principal and interest, but this is backing out specifically what the dollar amount of the loan is, which is obviously going to be less than the total amount of payments made. In other words, you're not simply taking this number, multiplying it by 180. That would be your total loan payments. You're paying back over Yeah, you're paying back like 5902, 78 times 180 would be like 1,062,500. Yeah. That is the total out-of-pocket expenditures that you would have made over that entire 15 years. But the, the actual loan amount is this. It's no different than like with a car loan, okay? Yeah. You know, you borrow maybe $30,000 for a car loan, but, and your, your payments are or whatever they are, but the, the reality is you end up paying more than $30,000 because of the interest cost. Right. Okay. Well, on, on the minor calculator, so what, what, what's, uh, what's going on with your calculator mind? Wait. You have reverse polis notation on the HP-12. That's why I recommend the, the 10B. The 10B is the most straightforward calculator ever. Well, okay. I, I can switch it though. So I can switch it. Yeah. So all you, all you need to do, you know, once again, if, if you enter all this information, then you should still be able to get the same answer. Okay. All right. Now, once we've got the 795,941, that is a set. Land plus buildings. And you see the final calculation that we do here is to simply say what are our expected construction costs, okay, of, and we've just simply estimated those to be 600000 so we would subtract those out. And that leaves us with 195941 and 38 cents as this is the maximum amount we can spend on land. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Possibly could be. Yeah. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Now we kind of work back and take a look at, at the construction cost here. So what, what assumption are we making about construction cost? What? 60 bucks a square foot, right? Yeah. In other words, how do I get that? Well, if my construction cost are 600000 and my property is 10,000 square feet, 600,000 divided by 10 would be $60 per square foot construction cost. Make sense? Okay, everybody good? Mark, question or comment? Okay, now, let's do this. Um, Let's go ahead and, and, and take a look now at the reverse of this, which is effectively the, the, the front door approach. Now, the front door approach is just the reverse. You're saying, well, why do we have to do both? Well, it depends on the situation that you're actually looking at. I'll explain. So in this circumstance, 
with the back door approach, what are we doing? We're basically saying, all right, you know, we're looking around, eventually, you know, do a project. We know, we know with certainty this is going to be our, our rental rate. Okay? We know these are going to be our operating costs. We know these are going to be our loan terms. So based on all of that, and we want to do this project, this is the maximum amount we can afford to spend. Does that make sense? That is the purpose of the back door. The front door is going the other direction and saying we know how much our land is going to cost. We know how much our construction costs are. We need to figure out what is the supportable rental rate for those costs. Yes, sir? So I just want to go back to the intro, make sure I know where to get this number from. The uh, price per square foot per year, that you get that from your research? Reese. Okay, you have to research. Okay. From Reese, like the, the, data, the, the data source that you guys looked at today. You know, in other words, where, where it was telling you, here are the rental rates, mm -hmm. okay, for a particular property type. That's where you're going to populate that number from. Also, from that same report, it's going to tell you what are the occupancy rates for that particular area. That's where you're going to populate that. It also is going to probably tell you an average set of operating expenses or a, a percentage of income of operating expenses. That's where you're going to populate that. It's when you get down now to the financial details that you're going to have to use potentially another source, which is a local lender, okay, or whoever it is that you're using as a lender. Every lender is different. Think about lenders much the same way that you would think about retailers, okay? Every retailer is a little bit different. You know, the product that you may get at Walmart is different than the product you may get, you know, and, and, or priced differently than you might get at Target, that you might get, you know, somewhere else. And very much it's the same situation with lenders that usually lenders specialize by property type. In, in many cases, especially more of the smaller local lenders, they'll say, we only lend on multifamily deals. We only lend on office buildings. We only lend, and, and if that's not the case, and they do tend to generalize into a lot of different property types, chances are that may not be the lender you want to go to because they may not have the expertise to really deal with all of those different property types. So, you know, there's, there's usually a good specialized lender, usually by property type. Like yeah, that, that has been my experience. One, I guess a series of questions. So when we finish this analysis, this is the best case scenario. And in a real in a real world situation, would you recommend? It's the best case in the sense of, of this. We have to know this is accurate. We have to know this is accurate. We have to know this is accurate. You know, all of these are assumptions. But the, the, the whole idea behind this is we have to be comfortable that those assumptions are reasonable. And this is what Mark was talking about in terms of trusting the data. You know, Reese data for the most part has been scrubbed and been, you know, looked at you know, really closely to ensure that it's as accurate as it possibly can be. You know, a lot of times the information that you may get from a local broker or salesperson, it may be puffed up a little bit and, and you may not necessarily get the most accurate information that, that might be out there. So you have to be a little bit careful with that in terms of, of the accuracy of that information. Because you can go to a local broker and you simply say, what are rents in this local market? They might say 20 bucks a square foot. Well, if you put that in your model at 20 bucks a square foot, that's going to translate into a much higher number down here that you could potentially spend on this project. But if, if the reality is you can only get 15, you're screwed. So you follow the old phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So the, the, the whole thing is to be conservative here with all of these assumptions so that you're at least starting out with a reasonable set of assumptions with regard to what the values are actually going to be. So it would be, if, if you're trying to create a, a different scenario to make the scenario harder, then you want to be more conservative. Yes. In your market. Yes, absolutely. In other words, if you want to, you know, just stress test the deal, so to speak, right. you know, you go in, you start putting in maybe, well, what if I can only achieve $12 a square foot? What if my occupancy rate is really only 80%? What if my operating expenses are higher than this, that they're maybe $60,000? How is all of that going to translate into the bottom line? And what you're going to find is that's going to lower this number, meaning that um, effectively it may make the deal a no-go project.
Okay, correct. Yes, ma'am. And that goes back to what we're saying here. Transaction doesn't work on the back of the napkin. Yep. Don't try to force it. Right, yeah. That's, that's the worst thing that you can possibly do is to try to force fit it to, to sort of say, all right, yeah, the Reese reports came back at 15 bucks a square foot. You know what? Yeah, they're wrong. You know, I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to get $25 a square foot for my property because my property is a premium property in this market. And, you know, that level of, of, of kind of hubris, you know, hubris of, of just sort of, you know, automatically assuming that you're going to be able to somehow, you know, get that does not make the project work. Yes. Yep. But so you calculate this for a pre-construction, something that yes. you're going to make? Well, you, can, you can use this for any type of model. You can use this for pre-construction, for pre-purchase. You can use this as the, um, a fundamental model to, to like buy an existing property that you want to reposition. This model is very flexible. Now, granted, you can you may have to make a couple of little minor alterations to it to get precisely what it is you're looking for. But fundamentally, it is the flow of logic from here to here that is mission critical that you begin to to, to actually wrap your head around and you understand. This should be pretty much just almost, it, it, it should be ingrained into your mind of being able to do this without looking at any sort of, of you know, document. I mean, it literally should just be there. And this, this is back of the envelope, back of the napkin. This is fundamental drive-by real estate 101. Yeah. This is going. the easy stuff, okay? <laughs> but it's great, but it only gives you the 10,000 foot you can't dodge either. Yeah. But that's why the assumptions are so important in doing this. And what's really interesting, and can I go back to, uh, if I can, to what Quincy was saying? So look at this equation right here. This is the issue of, gee, is there a profit to buying the land right. in this deal? Well, it may be that, oh, wait, that may be the asking price for the building. And you say, oh, all right, but not construction. It's the price on the deal. So there are different ways to insert different criteria so if it's a ground-up development, this is the deal. If it's an existing apartment building, and those are the pieces of information, then, my goodness, the price is probably low. You go ahead and you do to the next phase. Remember, this is that study phase that I said in the development process. So just the study phase. And, and, and it's sort of going to go with that a little bit different. So let's say we've gone through all of this, and this is telling us that this is supposedly the maximum value we can spend for the land. So the land that we want to buy to build this on, let's say it's priced for $250,000. Does this deal make any sense? No. If the land is priced at $150,000, then it probably makes sense to, to, to move forward with the deal. That's the way you begin to kind of, of, of think about this. But there's another thing. So let's say that he's selling it and the price is $250,000. I can make an offer of $150,000 maybe we'll negotiate our way to that. Mm -hmm. So it also is an, it, it's an indicator of how you can proceed in writing that letter of intent or negotiating the terms on a contract. Um, okay, so when you, this is kind of off topic, but when you look at the, trying to search for like the, the market, the square foot, okay, I'm sure like none of us would be building like a 40 unit Right out of the right out of the back. Right. Um, so could that still be accurate for like a ten oh, yeah. unit complex? I like use this for you know the smaller deals is you know under ten thousand square feet. Oh okay. This is why pretty much has ten thousand square feet. I mean, you know, to to meet the the, the the math and the process are identical. Okay. The complexity of the deal, and this is you know Mark and I have had this sort of conversation that my approach you know, in, in the way that I tend to sort of look at things from this, this program is I tend to focus on small deals personally, but I also tend, that's why I tend to teach our small deals because in my mind, I can get my head around and I think you can get your head around, you know, these smaller, you know, single sort of use sort of properties, but then you can obviously make that more complex at a later time whenever you're more comfortable with those, you know, the mechanics of the smaller deals. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, when we were talking about recent the market research, like if you could just use that for... No, and you can, and, 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 absolutely. And, and you can also do this on a per square foot basis as well. In other words, you could get rid of this and simply put $1 there and go through the whole math 
and it would tell you then how much you could spend on a per square foot basis on construction cost and on land. You know, so there's you know that's another adaptation, and we'll I'll show you that once we pull up the spreadsheet, you know, live. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, I think it's because what I find to me works best is working through this by hand and sort of showing you here is how you go from one step to the other. That is going to be useful to you instead of just sim simply saying, here's a spreadsheet, pop the numbers into the, to the boxes and see what it shoots out, okay? So, you know, that's the, the reason for kind of going through this in, in a little bit more of a laborious format of just sort of showing you the math, okay? And all the math is right there for you in the sense of kind of the calculation steps. The only piece that should be a little bit, you know, problematic is this whole business about what is referred to as an amortization constant. Okay, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Yep. So when the small and large formula is the same. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's why it's so valuable to understand this. Okay. Yep. The devil's in the details. We said earlier about letter of intent and the due diligence because on that piece of land they have this wetland mitigation this and and all that, and it, that's going to make, even though the land is inexpensive, the cost of the yes. Yes. makes it unrealistic yep. to do this project. Yep. So that's why, you know, this is just a simple construction cost, right. about, like said, 60 bucks a square right. foot, but what are about all those other hard and soft costs, as we right. call them, that you don't know, and that creates uncertainty, in it. and if you don't know it, don't do it. Or with a redevelopment project, those construction costs may be a lot more difficult to calculate than on new construction. Because on a redevelopment project, which is pretty much all I have done, or just redevelopments of commercial buildings, it is difficult to completely determine what your construction budget is going to be, because there are a lot of unknowns. You know, what are you going to be required to do by a local building code official versus what you may want to do, you know? Are you going to have to put in a, a sprinkler system if the building is less than 5,000 square feet? Okay, that may make a difference because that sprinkler cost might be 35 bucks a square foot to put into the property. You follow what I'm saying? You know, so you know those sorts of things that you've got to be able to kind of uh, back away from and, and um, you know begin to evaluate. You know, so it, it, while we try to simplify this, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff that goes into this. So can I make one other comment? So it's interesting, due diligence period you mentioned, Carol. So this is the key. If it's a nice square piece of land, there's no mitigation, there's no environmental, there's nothing else like that, it's pretty straightforward. But that's why that all those steps, all those disciplines, the level of complexity just magnified with any deal, certainly it's under renovation, under construction, or uh, as a repair, renovation job, or frankly, has a lot of political and other items, and dollar signs come up. So, this is still a good rubric, and I'm sure that in all of your deals, I mean, you have a contingency. Absolutely. Even once you know your number, add 5, 10, 15, 20%, depending on the uncertainty and risk, and then you can figure out whether the bottom line makes sense. Okay, now let's go to the top of the page, and let's work through that as an example. It'll we'll, we'll, we'll probably be a little bit quicker because we've already kind of worked through this one. So using, in this case, now the front door approach, all right? So we start out knowing our site acquisition cost of one night, and obviously the numbers are just the reverse of the others, but I'm gonna kind of just sort of flow it through here so we can sort of see. All right, so that is our cost of land. Then we have our construction cost of the 600,000 which is then gonna give us our total expected development cost of the 795, 941.08. Okay, everybody cool with that? Mm -hmm. Very, very straightforward. All right, now we multiply by our loan to value ratio, okay? The loan to value ratio of 80% is simply another metric that a lender will dictate to you which is saying we're going to require a debt service coverage ratio of 1.2 and we're also going to limit the loan on the property to 80% of its value, okay? So in this case, 
All we're going to do, multiply. And what we end up with then is the permanent mortgage or the loan amount of the 
invoke the debt coverage ratio yet again. And if you remember, debt coverage ratio, we have set it at 1.2. It is equal to our net operating income divided by our annual debt service. But the, the point to sort of make clear here, in the previous problem, we started out with what? Our net operating income to get annual debt service. Here, we're flipping it, okay? And we're starting out with our maximum annual debt service of 70,833.33, meaning that now we need to solve for the NOI that we would need to substantiate that. So we simply would take the 70,833, multiply it by 1.2, and then that would give us 85,000 as our NOI. That make sense, everybody? Okay. Now, once we've got that, once we've got our NOI of 85,000, then what we're doing is we're basically working back up the income statements where now we're going to add to that our operating expenses for this property, which are $50,000, and that's going to give us our effective gross income of $135,000, okay? Then, to get our required gross revenue or our required potential gross income, what we're gonna do is we're going to take that effective gross income of 135000 and we are going to divide it by the occupancy rate of 90%, and that is going to give us our PGI, or overall required income, in this case of 150000 Okay. Then with two steps left, and we're done, which is to take the 150,000 of PGI and simply say how many square feet do we have of 10,000 square feet? What does that mean? Our rental rate needs to be per square foot per year. Okay. Now, you're saying, okay, well, once again, why do we go about and reverse the process and how is this different? This is different in the sense of here, we know what our land costs are, we know what our construction costs are, we know all of our loan terms, but what we are searching for is what is the minimum <coughs> rental rate that we would need to achieve on a per square foot basis in order for this property to be financially feasible. Does that make sense? So we're working the other way around. So in other words, this is where, like I said, if we knew all of that, and then we get down to this number, and then we go to the Reese report, and the Reese report tells us that rental rates for this area are 20 bucks a square foot, not 15. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for us? That's a good thing. It's a very good thing because that means this project is probably gonna be feasible because the market rental rate would have exceeded what our required rental rate would be for the property. Versus if we had looked at Reese after we've gone through all this and Reese had said, eh, $8 a square foot as a, a rental rate, the project doesn't make any sense. Okay? So I have a question for the good doctor. <laughs> Which analysis do you find is used more often, the front door or the back door? I mean, it, it totally depends on how you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say that one is absolutely used more than the other. I mean, it, it depends on how you approach the, the, the situation. Most of the, of the deals I do because I'm doing redevelopment deals, then I am typically, you know, sort of approaching it from this perspective of saying, I know what the, the, the price is on the property. I know, you know, within some certainty how much that I'm going to have to put in in terms of, of construction costs. And, and then kind of go through and then sort of see what this gives me. But I do tend to actually do both. 
And I tend to, to flip it and then say, all right, well, that's what it gave me, you know, going from that direction. Let me see now from the, from the other direction if it's going to give me the exact same thing. See, the, 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 the issue is sometimes the, the, the case, you know, where obviously I have made the numbers work out to be identical under both scenarios. But the, the, the point being is in a real life situation, those aren't necessarily going to be the same numbers on the top and on the bottom because of what you're really starting with. In other words, if we had started up here with the, the front door approach and we knew what the construction costs were and the, 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 uh, the acquisition cost, it might have been a much higher number or a lower number than what I put here, which would give us a different answer. And then down below, if we had, you know, the rental rate would have dictated effectively what we would have been able to spend. So to a certain extent, you're, you're really doing both. You are. And, but the reason why I raise the issue is that, and I have a bias, as I've said, I have a number of of these things, and I do the backdoor analysis when I know the market. And so if you know the market and you have the information, you kind of say, yeah, I mean, I can get, but let's go back to that West Palm Beach example. So for, from 2008 and 9, when the bubble took place up until I would say uh, the middle of last year, rents per month per square foot for multifamily near rise, high rise in downtown West Palm Beach never really got above two bucks a square foot. And I knew, having done the analysis, that new construction was not feasible. But I knew also that when it crossed that 225 number, deals were viable. And so I would send my brokers and others out in the market based upon, I can get 225 in that location or 235 in another location, I can begin to look for deals. And so if you have a great understanding of the market, you're basically not looking at the market and trying to figure out what the market's gonna deliver, you're looking at the market and seeing what properties can deliver. So it's just a, a different way of looking at things. If 